Alright guys, this is a long video. This is my presentation from the 2018 Homesetting Life Conference where I talked about off-grid solar for beginners. So I took that entire presentation, put it into a video for you guys. So if you want to attend the Homesetting Life Conference next year, it is going to be the first Sunday, Monday in August of 2019 and you can actually pre-purchase tickets for it already. Now, if you want to check out our off-grid solar basics course, and in this presentation, I kind of do a light overview of it. If you want to learn more about how to do off-grid solar the right way, um, I'll leave a link in the, in the description box and in the comments with a coupon code so that you can get our off-grid solar course at a discounted price. Enjoy the presentation. Let's begin. A little bit about me. So I grew up in London, Ontario in Canada, so if you sense some Canadian accent, or if I say house an odd way, or if I say the word bagel in a different way that, than you're used to, you, you are correct with your assumption that I am Canadian. So I'm a proud university dropout. I studied mechanical engineering at the University of Western Ontario, just for two years. I worked as a construction and maintenance electrician from the ages of 21 to 25, so I have about four four and a half years of working as an electrician. I biked through, through Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Australia. Um, that was definitely one of the biggest growth experiences of my life. Um, and, I, and another really big growth experience was building my own tiny house in Tucson. So I had no prior construction experience um, aside from working as an electrician where I don't learn how to do framing or, or anything like that. But that was a huge experience, and I had an, ins an insane amount of feeling overwhelmed. And I'm sure if you're like just wanting to do homesteading or living off-grid, is that there might be that feeling of overwhelmment, and it's totally normal, and you're, you're not alone in that, in that feeling. So I live completely off-grid uh, with, my, with my wife, and we live completely off-grid with solar, and we do rainwater harvesting in the desert as well, even on 11 inches of rain per year. And we've been doing that since uh, December of 2016. I've been working, uh, basically my wife and I, we both work as entrepreneurs online, digital entrepreneurs is kind of the, the phrase that a lot of people use now. Um, so we're completely location independent. And that was actually one of the first things that we, had, we figured out before we even decided that we wanted to live off-grid or homesteading was getting our finances kind of in check so that um, we could do this because we knew that it was gonna cost a lot of money upfront. So goals for this presentation, I wanna show you how easy off-grid solar can be to run your off-grid home. I personally don't like to deal with grid-tied systems and the reason for that is because once you start getting into grid-tied systems, you have to start dealing with permits and inspectors. And something that Doug even mentioned yesterday is like, when you're looking at land is to talk to the county and start to see what kind of regulations or what kind of restrictions that, that you might have. I really love where I live because I can build anything that I want exactly how I want it, and nobody can tell me whether it's right or wrong. I don't have inspectors coming by and saying like, oh, you can't do that or you can't do this. Um, what's great about it is that I can do it exactly how I want. Hold on, can I, can I interject? Yeah. Can you post videos on YouTube? Post videos on YouTube? Do you post videos on I post a lot. I'm going to talk about my YouTube. Your comment section blowing up with inspectors. <laughs> I do post a lot of videos on YouTube. I've got like over 800 videos on YouTube between two of my channels. On my main channel, Handyman, which uh, I'll have a link up to it a little bit later on. It's got 400 videos documenting pretty well everything that I do on our property. Uh, I want to show you that off-grid solar has never been cheaper and to give you the confidence that, or the inspiration that you can indeed do it yourself. And I do think there is a certain subset of people that can certainly do it yourself. There's, you know, you might have a friend or family member that is completely incompetent. They don't even know how to use a toilet plunger. I've come across people like that. And maybe those people, it's not right for them, but I think if you take the time to learn and to educate yourselves and to follow the right people, you can certainly indeed do it yourself. So let's quickly talk a little bit about electrical safety. If anybody knows the movie Crank with Jason Statham, uh, this is probably not something that you necessarily want to do, but the premise of the movie was that he, he had to keep his heart going. And so what he's doing, so he uses a number of, a, a number of ways to keep his heart going. Uh, sniffing cocaine, shooting himself with epinephrine, and then another way which does really get your heart going because I've, I've been shocked by electricity a number of times 
is he's basically he's got one lead to a battery going on his nipple right here and the other one connected right to his mouth. So that's certainly going to be a good conductor of electricity. And I can tell you, after you get shocked by electricity, your heart is just like It is kind of a cool experience. So getting, elect getting an electrical shock at any voltage or any amperage has the potential to be lethal. Obviously, higher voltage, higher amperage, there's a much higher risk of actually le lethal death. Um, so that's one thing that I really want you guys to keep in mind is that if you're ever working on ele an electrical system, how potentially, dangerous, how potentially dangerous that it can be. I always like to think of electricity as if you're handling a gun. So you don't sit there with your gun and just wave it around, a loaded gun, and just be like, yeah, like this is great. You treat it with respect. You respect that it has the potential to be lethal, and th that's the, the same way that you want to look at electricity. You want it, you want to respect it. Be mindful of your tools. So the only time that you're ever going to be wiring something live when you're working on an off-grid solar system is when you're wiring up the batteries. You can't drain the batteries all the way down to zero. It completely destroys the battery and you're never going to be able to revive them. So whenever you're wiring batteries, metal tools are a very good conductor of electricity. So just be very mindful of what you're doing because if you ever drop a tool across the positive and the minus of the same battery, it is going to call it. It creates what is called a dead short, where there's going to be a huge surge of electricity going through this tool, and then consequently, it could create what is called an arc flash, and that just means that, that there's going to be sparks and things flying up at you. So just be very mindful of that. And there are actually insulated ratchet tools that you can actually get as well. Also, use the proper wiring and connectors. Something that I see a lot, and many of you have commented about my video talking about pure living for life. There's a lot of people that talk about solar and have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. They're not electricians, they're not electronics engineers or anything like that, and they can be a very, very bad source of information, and it can actually dissuade you from wanting to actually do it. So YouTubers like pure living for life, excellent example of how not to do it. So like what Mike was talking about yesterday, find leaders or mentors in that field um, and follow their advice as opposed to random guys on YouTube. Always wire batteries last. So that's the same thing, batteries are always live. So that's the very last thing that you're gonna ever wanna uh, wire on an electrical system. So one important thing to note about electricity is that it's always trying to find ground. So electricity works on a difference of potential which is something that we measure in volts. So high voltage wants to move towards a low voltage system in order to balance the two. So the electrical panel that you have in your house, it has basically what, a direct connection to the ground. And when I mean ground, I mean like the actual, like the earth and the ground. You, can, you would consider that to be zero volts. So you have your 120 volt system or 240 volt system, and then you have your ground, which is at zero volts. So, an electrical panel like that is grounded either through a grounding rod or a grounding plate or the connection is made to, made to a metal water main. Obviously it has to be metal, it can't be a plastic water main. And you might think to yourself, how do birds sit up on high voltage electrical wires? And the reason why birds, so maybe this little guy right here, how can it sit up on the electrical wire and not be killed? And the reason why is that it doesn't have any connection to ground. So it can sit up there all day long and there's not going to be any current passing through it because it's not creating a conducting loop. Now, if you touch, if, say this bird right here, it touches this wire and the other one on the other side, which even though they might be at the same voltage, they're on different legs or different phases of the same electrical supply system. There's a difference of potential there and that bird is going to be toast. It's going to be cooked pretty quickly. It's going to, it's going to be dead. So when guys work on high voltage electrical wires and they're maintaining those wires, one, one way that they do it um, is that they use electric um, helicopters. And the reason why, because it doesn't have any connection to ground. So they're actually more safe using something like that than like a crane or like a boom, because that crane or that boom has a connection to ground. So why go solar? Energy independence is definitely one of the most important things. Ties in obviously with homesteading, we're trying to be much more self-sufficient. 
lower greenhouse gas emissions. So to produce panels and to produce batteries and the power components, there's going to be a certain amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are created in that process. But then there's also that payback period because um, you're producing all this energy and using it, but you're not creating greenhouse gas emissions at that time. So there's no unsightly power lines on your property. And this is, uh, this is a big thing for me. They are very unsightly, and I would not want to have power lines on my property. And it also may be very expensive to have power lines run to wherever your house is. It's very common for me to hear somebody talk about, yeah, I talked to the utility company, and it was going to be $10,000, $20,000 to have power lines run to your property. And then at that point, you're thinking, yeah, I could probably set up an off-grid solar system. And when you have electrical lines run to your property, then you actually have to pay for power on top of that too. So you're not really saving any money over the long term. You're also going to technically be blackout proof, and I say for the most part because there are components in solar systems that can certainly fail. Um, it's most likely going to be the, the inverter that's going to fail. Um, any failures, and one thing that I like about it is that if there are any failures in the system, since I set up the system and I built it myself, I'm competent enough with trying to troubleshoot it and figure it out, so I can actually fix it and I don't have to pay somebody else to do it, and I can do it much quicker. So, in, you know, certain contractors, they might be really busy and it might take, you know, many days or many weeks for them to fix an issue. Solar prices are always going down right now. Um, we're going to go a little bit more into that later on. Utility energy prices typically go up. I've never heard of utility prices actually going down. And I think they're really cool. Cost of solar. So prices have been dropping tremendously fast. And one of the main reasons why um, solar has been dropping so fast is because of the introduction of electric vehicles and hybrids, because of the batteries. So quality solar panels can be found between about 60 cents to a dollar per watt. They used to be anywhere between two to three dollars a watt. Um, some of you, if you have solar systems, you may remember paying that much for panels, but they keep getting cheaper and cheaper. It's like when I was a kid, 15, 16 years old, um, I remember when computers were really starting to garner uh, a lot of attention and people were buying them. It used to be so expensive. You go a year from now, a year from when you buy your computer system and all the components that you buy are like, they're like half the price and you're like, why didn't I just wait a year to buy everything? And it's the same thing that's kind of happening with solar right now. So electric vehicles and hybrids have driven down lithium ion battery prices just because there's just so much supply of them. So with the cost of solar, it's typically just a huge upfront cost and it's a fixed price ongoing. So it's not like a variable rate. So for example, my solar system costs about $14,000, which includes the racking, the panels, the batteries, the power components. And if we take that over a 10 year payback period, which the batteries are going to be the weakest link in that, um, 10 years, divide, uh, 14,000 divided by 10 years, we have $1,400 per year. And then we extrapolate that over the course of a month, that's only $117 per month, which when you think of it, it's like, that's pretty standard. I know a lot of people in Arizona because of how much energy costs and the amount of air conditioning that we need there during the, uh, during the summertime is that their power bill can be anywhere between three to $500 a month. And that's not really that uncommon out there. Common measurement in units. So we're gonna get a little bit nerdy and then get into some more interesting stuff. So voltage is the pressure that pushes the current. It's measured in volts. Current is the flow of electrons through a point that is measured in amps. Uh, resistance is the opposition to current in a circuit and that is measured in what is called ohms. So the best way to kind of describe voltage, low voltage would be like that. High voltage is like that. It's just like a lot higher pressure. It's got more punch to it. So how they kind of work together, we got our little amp here, he's getting kicked in the butt by the volt, and then the ohm is trying to resist it. So that's kind of the best way to explain how electricity works. <laughs> what is power? So power is the rate at which energy is being consumed. And I do want to make this point, power is not the same as energy. They are different terms. Typically in our conversations, we use power and energy kind of interchangeably, but in a physics sense, they're, they're, uh, they're different terms. So power is commonly measured in watts, so you might have a microwave that uses 1500 watts, and that's what they're referring to. So in order to calculate how much power something is, we take the number of volts that it runs at, multiply it by the number of amps. So say we have something that runs at 10 amps at 120 volts, 1200 watts is how much power that it uses. So what is energy? 
Energy is a fixed quantity, which means we can't change how much energy it takes to do something. Um, energy, energy is commonly measured in what is called watt hours or kilowatt hours. If anybody is a fan of the metric system, you will appreciate um, one kilowatt hour equals 1,000 watt hours. A standard home in the United States uses between somewhere between uh, 20 to 40 kilowatt hours per day. But the rate at which that power is being consumed or that energy is being consumed changes throughout the day. So that's what we mean by energy is a fixed quantity. Why is this important? Terminology needs to be consistent to have the right conversation. I've talked with solar designers who refer to battery capacity in terms of kilowatts instead of kilowatt hours, and that can be very confusing. So you can't say that you use 20 kilowatts per day of energy. It does, that just doesn't make any sense. So that would be like the same as me saying, there's a grocery store, but it's 10 miles per hour away. And you'd be like, what? Like, what are you talking, 10 miles per hour away? When you, in actuality, that you mean 10 miles. So let's look at some simple panel, ca simple panel calculations. So say we have a solar panel that, use, that generates 240 watts of power in full sun, and we leave it in a place that gets four and a half hours of solar insulation. So the term solar insulation is different than daylight hours. We're gonna go a little bit more into that a little bit later. So we take that number, 240 watts, we multiply it by four and a half hours. That equals 1,080 watt hours. Uh, just to simplify it, let's call it one kilowatt hour. Say our house requires 20 kilowatt hours in a day. How many panels would we need? Who's paying attention? 20? 20, 20 panels. We need 20 panels producing tw one kilowatt hour every day to meet our energy needs. Say we live in a location that it doesn't get four and a half hours of solar, solar insulation, we only get three hours. So instead of one kilowatt hour per day, that panel is now producing only 0.72 kilowatt hours. So instead of getting 20 kilowatt hours, we're only getting 14.4 kilowatt hours. So when people t tell me that solar is so easy in Arizona, and it's more difficult in the area that I live in, I say, it's not that it's, m that it's easier where I live, it's just more inexpensive. And it's the same way that rainwater harvesting for me probably costs three to four times as much, whereas like if I lived in Missouri down here, um, it would be a lot cheaper for me to do it here. So it's just kind of this pros and cons situation that we have. So we're no longer meeting our 20 kilowatt hour energy needs. So how does an off-grid solar system work? So we're just gonna keep it real nice and basic. Sunlight, it hits the solar panels and that produces power. The solar panels are wired to what is called a combiner box. So it combines the strings of wires that are coming from the panels. The power from the combiner box goes to what is called a charge controller, which is what charges your batteries. As you consume electricity in your house, um, electricity goes through the inverter, which converts the DC power that comes from the batteries and from the panels and converts it to AC or alternating current, which is what, if you plug anything in here, it's at AC, it's a alternating current. So what is some of the best ways to save money on solar? Number one way always is to reduce your energy consumption. L the less energy that you require, the less panels that you need, the less batteries that you're gonna need, the smaller power components that you need. As a, an off-grid solar system, I'm gonna tell you, you can be designed to run pretty well anything that you want. Like if you wanna run hot tubs, you wanna charge electric vehicles, you wanna run you know, either six or eight kilowatt air conditioners, which is very typical on a standard like 3,000 square foot house, it can certainly be done. So when we think of that, big energy consumers, hot tubs, big ovens, big homes, big air conditioners, it can all actually be done on off-grid solar. There's nothing that is really stopping you except money. It always comes down to money. So you wanna save money, you wanna be very mindful of your energy consumption. So instead of thinking, I wanna build a three or 4,000 square foot house, maybe a 1,000 square foot house, with much more efficient appliances would be a much better option to save you money on your solar system. And ironically enough, most systems are also undersized. So a lot of questions and troubleshooting that people send to me, um, most systems are completely undersized. So what are the biggest energy consumers in the house? Number one is always gonna be heating and cooling that house. So what are some ways that we can reduce our heating and cooling bill? 
So we're going to reduce our energy needs by building an energy efficient home. Number one thing. So if you want to build your own house, some very good methods of doing that would be building a rammed earth house, an earth bag house, earth ship, straw bale, a cob house, insulated concrete form. So Doug and Stacey, they're building the root cellars insulated concrete form. It's a much more efficient way of building a house. And it's going to save you a ton of money. One thing that I'd really highly recommend is for heating and for cooling is to buy very high efficiency mini splits that can both heat and cool. So Mitsubishi makes good ones and also make sure that it has a SEER rating of at least 20. So I know my mini split, I did not invest in a good one. It uses about twice the amount of energy than a more expensive mini split uses. So instead of running at 1000 watts, or sorry, instead of running at 500 watts, my mini split runs at about a thousand watts. And also make sure, just because you live in Missouri, check the operating temperature, the minimum operating temperature for freezing climates. Two thousand dollars where a far less efficient unit costs a thousand dollars. So it can be very worthwhile to keep your solar system costs down by investing in a very good mini split. Next biggest energy consumer is hot water. So I do, I'm always out for, or I always recommend that people experiment. So you can experiment with integrated water heaters and collection plates that you normally see on, on the roofs of homes. Um, they also do require a pump to keep them circulating. But one important thing is that they might not be worth the cost and the complexity to do this. It can just be a lot easier to invest in some extra panels or possibly some extra battery storage in order to heat your water. I was talking to actually a couple yesterday that they spent $8,000 on a hot water collection system and it doesn't really even work that well. So they kind of wasted that money and it's not even doing its job. So batch water heaters, um, they would certainly be good during the summer and maybe the spring months, but they may not necessarily work during the winter months. And a batch water heater, um, so it has collection plates that you see on the roof and then there's usually a big tank on top and it just works with ther thermodynamics to keep the, the water cycling through it and to heat it up. So technically, I would not consider propane or natural gas to be off-grid. So that's one reason why I've wired everything in my house to be electric. Um, it's just one less thing that I have to think about and um, propane and natural gas are also fossil fuel so I wouldn't consider them to be off-grid. And even though electric water heaters, I would not consider them to be very energy efficient in terms of converting electrical energy to heat. They are inexpensive. They're very easy to fix if they ever break down. They require no venting they're, and they're also very to install. One way that I keep my water, um, my water heater from using too much energy is that I just put it on a timer so that it's not heating water during the nighttime when we don't even need it. Another big energy consumer is cooking. So we've got Paul from Sun Oven here. So he, he using a Sun Oven to cook w directly from the sun can certainly reduce your energy consumption. Um, you can cook over a fire, use an air fryer. Another really good option might be a wood stove. So Doug and Stacey, they use a wood stove um, in order to cook and also heat during the winter time. So that's kind of a nice little hybrid system to reduce your energy bill, um, especially during the winter time when you're not going to be collecting as much solar. So you're not going to be getting as many sun hours during the winter, which you can reduce your, uh, your solar consumption just by using a wood stove. Um, you could also use an instant pot or a pressure cooker that certainly reduces the amount of energy that you're going to be needing for cooking certain foods as opposed to say like a crock pot. Uh, propane and natural gas, um, I don't consider those to be off-grid either. Another big energy consumer is lighting. This one's actually really easy to fix. Instead of installing incandescent light bulbs, just install, just install LEDs and, they're, and they just use a fraction of the amount of energy. And just use timers wherever you can. And for those of you with big families, biggest energy consumer is people. So if you have less people, you're going to be using a lot less energy. So how to calculate your usage? So there's a number of ways that you can calculate usage. You can use what is called a kilowatt meter. So you can take this, you plug it into the wall, you can plug a fridge or some type of appliance into it, and then you can see how many kilowatt hours that it actually uses. You can use a clamp type multimeter, and that's just to calculate the instantaneous power. Um, you can look at your monthly power bill and just see how many kilowatt hours that you use over a month, and then you can cut it down to see how much you actually use over the course of a day. This to me is definitely the most important step. 
because if you don't know how much energy that you're consuming, you have no idea how big to build a solar system. So you gotta start with this first and kind of figure that out. And one thing that can be very difficult is that if you don't have the house built yet, how do you actually figure it out? So you have to use, um, you would have to estimate. So there are bigger, um, there are things that you can get to calculate um, basically how much your entire house uses at once. There's one system called Open Energy Monitor, TED Pro Home. Um, so that's what this is right here. So you just hook it up to your electrical panel and you can figure out how much energy that, energy that you use. I've never used one, but they're definitely recommended. I use about, and if you remember my talk from yesterday, I live in a 200 square foot house. Everything is electric, electric water heater, um, electric mini split, all electric cooking appliances, everything. I only use around seven to 11 kilowatt hours per day, and that just depends on the time of year. The average American home uses 30 kilowatt hours. So in order to compensate, say I had a standard size home, I would be using a lot, I would be using a lot closer to 30 kilowatt hours. And at that point, my solar system, that might've cost 10 or $15,000, maybe I've got to spend 25, 30, 40, $50,000 on it. So you can start to understand that really how much we're using in our consumption plays such a big role in how much this is gonna cost. And it, yes, it can be difficult to figure out if your house isn't built yet. So calculating max power usage, add together, one thing that you wanna do this for is to determine how big your inverter is gonna be. So your inverter is taking the DC power from the batteries and then supplying AC power to your house. So you wanna to add together the biggest power loads that could be running at once to, to decide what size inverter that you're gonna need. So your air conditioner, your water heater, your fridge, your pumps, your washing machine, your dryer, those are the biggest power loads in your house. So I know for example, my mini split uses a thousand, oops. It uses a thousand watts. My water heater is about 1500 watts. My pump is a thousand, my cooking appliances. I tell my wife, only use one at a time. And she does most of the time. <laughs> So that equals about 4,500 watts. So I know that if everything is running at once, I need to be able to supply my house with 4,500 watts. One thing that is cool about inverters is that they have multiple ratings. So they have what is called a continuous wattage, and then they can also surge for certain periods. So I know my inverter, it's a Schneider uh, SW4048. It can run at 4,000 watts continuous, it can run at 4,400 watts for 30 minutes, and it can also surge up to 6,000 watts for about five seconds. And it's able to do that mainly if for pumps and for motors that require a very quick surge of power. So that's why the inverters can do that. Power creation, so let's talk about solar insulation. So I live in an area right near Mexico where, as you can see on this map, the redder that it is, the more sun hours that you get per year or up in Missouri, somewhere in this area over here, where it's a little bit more yellow and a little bit more green. So you just can't use the sunrise and the sunset times in order to figure out how many hours that you're gonna be getting on your solar panels because during the morning and the evening time, you don't really create very much. You might be creating like 50 watts or 100 watts, whereas like when I'm at full sun, I'm producing 35 hundred watts. So to find the average numbers for your ge geographic area, you're going to want to look at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory website and some solar rules of thumb. So fixed panels that uh, don't have any tracking generate the most power when tilted at an angle roughly equal to the latitude of your location. So if you live at 40 degrees latitude, you want to tilt your panels up like that at about 40 degrees. So your array should face as close to true south as possible, plus or minus 10 degrees. And that obviously depends on your location, location of buildings and such. To increase your power output, you can get racking um, with an adjustable tilt mechanism. I personally am not a big fan of them, um, just because it adds complexity, and I like things to be as simple as possible. And then you can tilt your, your panels up to about four times per year in order to generate the most amount of power from them. So avoid placing your panels where they might be getting shaded by anything, by trees, by power lines, by chimneys, even by antennas. Even a very small amount of shade on a solar panel can drastically reduce how much power comes out of it. Solar panels produce power even when it's cloudy out. 
this is something that um, I get into a lot of people in the comments section of my YouTube videos is that they think when it's cloudy out, I produce zero power. And you still produce, when the sun is up, your solar panels are going to be producing power. It's just that when it's cloudy out, it's typically somewhere between 30 to 60 percent of what they normally produce. So my panels produce anywhere between 1200 to 2200 watts when it's cloudy out, and they normally produce about 3500 watts. Also, don't forget about aesthetics. Um, hopefully you don't live in an area where you have any HOA regulations or anything like that. Um, even your significant other can tell you, you know, where you should put them. Um, placement and looks can certainly play a role in where you put your array and the amount of power that you're going to be generating from it. And also you can consider the time of use um, when orienting the array. So say for example you have a wood stove and you're not going to be consuming um, as much energy during the winter time you could actually tilt your panels so that they're going to be generating more power during the, uh, during the summertime when you, when you might be using a lot more air conditioning. So instead of going up to 40 degrees, maybe you go up to 30 degrees because the sun's going to be much, uh, it's going to be much higher during the summer months and you're going to be, those panels are going to be more efficient during the summertime. So real world example. So Tucson gets an average of about six and a half sun hours per day, which equals 2,372 hours per year. Um, say we're using our example of 20 kilowatt hours per day, multiply that by 365 days, 7,300 kilowatts per year. So we take those two numbers, 7,300 divided by 2,372. That means that we're gonna need approximately, and I say approximately for a reason, 3.0 kilowatts worth of panels. Now this is what is called a theoretical minimum. It doesn't take into account um, basically the efficiency of the inverter. Inverters are not 100% efficient, so they're typically around 92 to 95% efficient. Um, wiring losses, there's panel power loss. I want, oddly enough, as solar panels get hotter, they become less efficient for some reason. Um, and then there's also going to be seasonal variation. Now I get a lot of questions about wind power. And um, <clears throat> why don't you install a wind power system? Why don't you recommend it? It adds complexity to an off-grid system, and you may need a special hybrid controller or a separate charge control controller altogether. It needs to be tall for better efficiency. It can also be cost prohibitive, cost prohibitive. So it can be easier, I say this a lot, it can just be a lot easier just to add some extra solar panels or some extra battery storage to compensate for the amount of power that you generate from a wind generator. Also take a look at this photo. Here's some solar panels on the ground right here. One person can easily do that themselves. They can install those, those solar panels. There's no moving parts, there's no maintenance. And then to install a big wind generator, you need a crane and a truck and probably somebody else to install it. So it's not necessarily a very DIY friendly type thing. So there's also moving parts, there's maintenance, and then there's also noise consequently because of that. And I say this for most of the United States, it's not necessarily worthwhile. And it just really comes down to there isn't the consistent wind velocities that you need in order to recuperate the money that you actually put into it. So that's why I say it can be a lot easier just to add some solar panels and some extra battery storage. So one thing that is really kind of annoying and confusing with solar panel companies is that there's two different ratings that they use. So one rating that they use is called standard test conditions. And this test condition only exists in laboratory settings or if you're in space. And then a much more accurate number is what's called the nominal op operating cell temperature, which is more realistic, it's real world results. So the difference here is if you look at a solar pan if you look at a website that is selling solar panels and it's like, ah, oh, I can get a 315 watt solar panel. Realistically, it's only a 230 watt panel in real world conditions. Why they do that, 315 sounds a lot better than 230. But you do need to know that there is a difference there. So there's a derating factor of about 70 to 73%. Based on our previous example where we needed a three kilowatt system, is if we take um, 10 of these LG panels, we multiply it by 350 watts, we think, oh, we're only gonna need 10 panels in order to get over that 3.08 kilowatts, realistically, we're actually going to need 14 panels. 
All these numbers are actually provided on the solar panel specs. So if you just look at the specs on it, it's gonna give you the STC number and then also the NOCT number. Solar panel mounts. So solar panels can either be mounted on the ground or on the roof. Ground mounting is, is certainly much more expensive. My racking system probably costs about $1,000. If I were to install them on the roof, maybe it would cost me a few hundred dollars. So what's great about basically mounting on the ground is that there's no extra weight on the roof. So if you're kind of worried about the structure of your roof, ground mounting is, a, is definitely a good option. Replacing the roof, something that you might want to think about. If you're going to be replacing the roof in five years, it would not really make a lot of sense to install all those panels on the roof because you're going to just have to take them off again to replace the roof. Also, you can position panels um, easier, a lot easier to true south and away from any potential sources of shade when you do a ground mount system like that. So that could be really important. Say you have a beautiful canopy of, of shade trees over your house. It might not be a good place to put those solar panels on the house, so it, it would probably be a lot better to do a ground mount system. And this is probably applicable for most people, but it was for me, is that I literally could not fit all the panels on the roof of my house because it was so small. Wiring the panels. So solar panels are wired in what is called, we call them strings. So we do this to get the voltage going to the charge controller at a voltage that is high and within the range of the controller. Like my controller needs a voltage from the panels between 40 to 140 volts. Why we do this is because when electricity runs at a much higher voltage, you, it's, it's a lower current. And when you're looking at a lower current, that means you can use a smaller wire gauge that also means that you're gonna save money because smaller wire gauge is cheaper than a heavier, heavier gauge, and it's more efficient. So when electricity runs at a higher voltage, it's much more efficient to do so. That's why the high voltage wires that you see like out on the street, they run in the thousands and thousands and thousands of volts because it's much more efficient to transfer that electricity over a long distance at a higher voltage. So just for, for an example, each one of my panels is about 33 volts when it's getting full sun. So when we wire three in series, we add that voltage together and we get 99 volts. That's what I was getting. 33 plus 33 plus 33 equals 99 volts. So when we come into the, into the combiner, each string of three panels has both a positive side and a negative side. And we run that to what is called the combiner box. So this is my combiner box here. The strings coming from the panels are running either into the side or coming up through the bottom here. So the combiner box takes each of those strings of panels and then combines them in parallel. So these connections right on the side here are parallel connections. Um, the I don't want to go into too much detail about the difference between that might get a little bit too nerdy. So when wiring in parallel, we don't add the voltage up, we add the current up. So each string of panels produces about seven amps at 99 volts. If we have five strings of panels and we add that current together, so seven plus seven plus seven, it's 35 amps at approximately 100 volts. So earlier I talked about my panels produce around 3,500 watts. If we take 35 amps and we multiply it by 100 volts, that's our power calculation right there. That's 3,500 watts. So from the charge controller, the wire is most likely gonna go underground through a trench, and then it's gonna go into what I call the heart of the system. So the wires from the solar panels are coming up this conduit right here. They go into the charge controller, which is what charges our batteries right here. When you consume electricity on the AC side of things, so this is just a standard household electrical panel, the, the power either comes directly from the panels and goes through the inverter, or it comes from the batteries and it goes through the inverter. And then on this side of things, it's just standard um, electricity, electrical wiring that you're gonna see in a house. One thing that is important to note is that when you're wiring up a DC system, so everything on this side of the electrical system for the solar, is all wired in DC or direct current. Everything on the other side where the breaker panel is, is all wired in, elect, um, in AC. So what's important to note about that 
is that they like to make, let's make things even more confusing, is that when you're wiring things in DC, the positive is red, the negative is black. When you're wiring things in AC, both phase one and phase two, which are your two hot wires, are both black and red, and then your neutral is white, and the neutral would be very similar to what the negative does. It's kind of like the return path for the, uh, for the electricity. So it's just important, you don't have to memorize this, but when you're wiring things up and, and you're looking at it and you're like, why is the positive on the DC side, why is it red? It's just, it's just a color coding that they use. And it becomes even more confusing when you go into different countries and different continents, none of these colors even apply. So if you go to Europe, if you go to Australia, they use a totally different color code for wires. Now let's talk about something that is really exciting to me, batteries. So lead acid batteries, which is the standard batteries that a lot of people use in their off-grid solar system, lead acid batteries only have what is called a 50% discharge rate. So if you buy 20 kilowatt hours worth of lead acid batteries, you, you can only use 10 kilowatt hours of, those, of the batteries. If you start going below the 50% mark, it starts to degrade the batteries. So they weigh about twice as much and they take up about twice as much space compared to lithium ion. They also need ongoing maintenance. So if you ever hear, hear people that they have to top up their batteries, they have to fill it up with distilled water and also around the connections on the batteries, they can corrode over time and then they should be cleaned up every once in a while. Many of these batteries, they also need to be sitting on the floor upright because they are filled with water. You have to top them up with water. They need to be sitting on the floor upright. They have a low cycle life compared to lithium ion. So they, what is considered one cycle is when you have them at fully charged at 100%, you bring them down to 50%, that is considered a cycle when it goes through that range. So they only last between 500 to 1000 cycles before they get to a point where you're going to need to replace them. Lithium ion batteries, so they have an 80% discharge rate. So in your cell phones, all of them are lithium ion now because they're just so much better. So at 20 kilowatt hour pack, you can use 16 kilowatt hours instead of 10. So you have much more capacity that you're actually able to use. They weigh about half as much and take up about half as much space. Um, I know a guy in my area that used uh, forklift batteries, which are lead acid batteries in his off-grid solar setup. And a big battery pack that he had weighed 700 pounds and he had to get that into his solar shed. They require no ongoing maintenance at all. They can be mounted any which way that you want. So you can mount lithium ion batteries, you can mount them on the ceiling if you wanted to. They also have three to four times the cycle life compared to lead acid, and which means that they can last between 1,000 to 3,000 cycles. So they are definitely really good. So these, this is my battery bank here. They came from a Tesla, well not a Tesla, they came from a smart car. So a fully electric smart car, and they're actually produced by Tesla. This battery module here comes from a Chevy Volt hybrid. So we can actually use recycled batteries from electric vehicles and hybrids, and that is what is bringing down the cost because we have so much more of a supply of these really high quality batteries that we can recycle and reuse them for our off-grid solar system. So we also use Tesla Model S modules. You can use modules from a Nissan Leaf. And here's where it comes down to, because you might be thinking, all right, these batteries sound great. They're gonna be a lot more expensive. So Trojan batteries, which is your standard lead acid batteries, they cost about $130 per kilowatt hour. We recently just bought used Tesla Model S modules for $250 per kilowatt hour. So about twice the price. But when you take into account that they have a 30% higher discharge rate and that they last three to four times as long, which sounds like the much better option at that point. Lithium ion by far. And the funny thing is, is that we're actually finding these Chevy Volt hybrid modules. I just bought a set, so a 16 kilowatt hour set at $1,800 and it came from a, sal a, a salvage yard because when a car goes in to get salvaged, they rip out the battery because it's, it's definitely uh, an expensive part of it. So 16 kilowatt hours at $1,800, we're almost at the same price as brand new lead acid batteries and it has all the exact same benefits. So it's starting to get to the point where lead acid batteries, they suck and they're even more expensive. 
And also what's great about this, even though it might not be useful to have these batteries in a car, because the reason why that they have to replace these batteries over time is because over time the batteries are going to degrade. So they have their 100% capacity when, when, you first, uh, when you first get them. Over time they degrade and, and typically when they get around to about 80% of their total capacity, they have to take them out of a car because it reduces your range by 20%. So people want to get that range back so they replace the batteries. So the price of these batteries and they keep dropping due to the increase of supply. So with more people getting involved with electric vehicles, like with Tesla, with the new Model 3 that's, that's coming out and being produced, we know that there's going to be a huge influx of these batteries coming into the market, so that just keeps dropping the price and making things a lot cheaper. Um, let's talk about inverters. So I kind of explained this earlier, it takes the DC power from your batteries and converts it to AC power. So inverters, they, like I said, they have multiple ratings, continuous wattage, 30 minute ratings, five second ratings. Um, I would say it's really important to buy a good one. One thing that I've seen a lot of people do, if you buy an inverter that you're gonna be running, say like your RV or house off, and you can actually plug something into the back of it like this, like you can actually plug an extension cord into it, that is not a good inverter that you wanna buy. So buy a good one because it is definitely one of the most kind of finicky pieces of your solar system and it's the most common thing that's going to fail. And also most can be doubled up in the future for future expansion. So if you want to start off with a 4 kilowatt inverter and you think maybe down the road I'm going to need some more, I'm going to need some more power, maybe I'm going to be running a shop and I want some more, most of them can be doubled up. So you can run them in series and then it'll supply twice the amount of power. So a really cool application that my buddy Liam and I designed is we made what's called our little solar gener generator or solar trailer. So a solar trailer doesn't require any permits or anything like that, so if you're kind of worried about that, it's a temp I would consider it a temporary source of power. Um, and you can reuse, the way that we design these things is that we can reuse the components for a future more permanent solar system. So all these panels, and what's happening on the inside, so all the components, you can reuse them for a bigger, more permanent system. There's a less initial cost, so instead of thinking, I have to buy 12 or 15 solar panels, or I have to buy 20 kilowatt hours worth of batteries, maybe you can get away with six panels for a bit, and you could also get away with 10 kilowatt hours worth of batteries, so it lowers that initial cost. It can be moved, which can be very useful. And my buddy Liam and I, we're gonna be building these and selling these um, in September when I finish my garage. So this is what it looks like on the inside here. So we just have our charge controller, we have our, our inverter. These are batteries from a Tesla Model S. So these are the Model S modules. So if, this were, if these were lead acid batteries, not only would we have to maintain them, but we couldn't mount them on the wall like that, and they would have to be sitting on the ground, and they would take up a lot more space. So that's one reason why we use lithium ion. It's because they're so much smaller, and so much better in, in so many ways. So one really important thing, follow me on YouTube, handyman.tv. So that'll take you right to my YouTube channel. I document all my projects, so if you actually wanna see me build my current solar system, there's a playlist on there, I think it's called Off Grid Solar, it's right on my homepage. Um, all my other projects you can follow right on there. All my major ones, I always have playlists right on my main homepage. And what we have and what I'm selling at the back there is our off-grid solar basics course. So myself, as an electrician, and my business partner, Liam, we've created a very simple system or a, a simple course to help people get started with off-grid solar. So it's a 90-page PDF. We have spreadsheets to help you calculate how big of a system that you're gonna need. And we have bonus videos that you're never gonna see on YouTube of me actually uh, designing and going through the wiring of my own system and a lot of tips and tricks um, that I have being an electrician. Um, we have a material and price list of my entire system. And it's just a one-time price. There's no subscription or anything like that. Any questions? Yes. On your recycle video, do you have any way to test them to make sure you're not getting involved in one? Typically, with some of those battery systems, there might be a warranty that the, salvage, that the auto parts place will provide on it if it is a dead unit. So that's one thing when you're buying them, ask them about any warranties or any guarantees that they have. Am I out of time? No, got a few more questions. Okay, sweet.
Yeah. Yup. Yep. 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 All right. Questions. So I heard of, about some people that they have their solar systems, but they're also set up to the grid where they're like generating so much power that they're actually selling it back to the utility companies. Is there like, do you have any plans for that, or do you know kind of anything about that as far as like whether it would be cost effective to do that, or would it just be better to? have only what you need for your solar needs. Hmm. That's a good question. I guess you got here late. What's yeah, that? Like the first sentence you said, right? Don't tie into the grid. It's re getting get a permit. No, no, that's, that's, well, that's what it, that's what it really kind of ties into. So once you start dealing with a grid tied system, um, you might have to run power lines to your property. That might cost a lot of money. Um, I personally really don't like to do it because then you're, then you're still connected to the grid. And energy prices that the, that the uh, utility companies are buying back at are, have been dramatically going down and down and down and it becomes a lot less worth it than actually produce, having like a solar farm, for example, and selling it back. So it's really not worth it. It, de it, it depends. It really depends on the area. It depends on the region. So it's really hard to answer, but it would depend. I really want people to know this, the person that asked about the grid tie. Okay, so this is more of just a comment and advice rather than a question, and we've already spoken about this. We have two systems. One is grid tied with battery backup at our homestead. The other one is DC off-grid, okay? So if you're even considering tying into the grid, you wanna make sure that you understand exactly what you're getting into with them, okay? Because every company is different, and especially a rural electric co-op can be completely different than a big company like in the city. Because some states are not going to give you the advantages and some of the incentives that other states would. But let me just tell you about our experience just really quick, okay? Service charge went from $20 a month up to $50. So even if we are producing 100% of our own power, May, June, July, August, whatever, depending on however big your system is, it doesn't matter, we're still paying $50 a month no matter what we do. Then the net metering thing. You're banking, if they offer net metering, you're banking your kilowatt hours, so you're, let's say you produce in the summer months more than you're using. So you're banking up those hours to try to use those in the lean months. Well, with our electric co-op that we got suckered into, um, they're zeroing out our banked hours December 31st. So when do you need those banked hours? You need them January, February, March, when you're producing less power. Mm -hmm. So hindsight is 2020. We wish we never would have done a grid tied system. Our property is an 1800 farmhouse we already had, it already has electricity. What I'm trying to say is, we wish we would have designed it to be off grid completely. Like the cabin, it's only 500 watts, which we love. So mm. anyway, that's just a little bit of advice. Make sure that you understand from the electric company that they sit down with you and you understand exactly what you're getting into with them. Awesome. One other, just one other thing, quick thing to mention about that. Even if you're having a company do a solar system for you, you should still learn all this stuff. And the reason is, because if you're uneducated about this, contractors do extreme markups based on people's ignorance on the topic. So it's like going to a mechanic and them saying it's gonna be $1,000 to fix this, when in reality it might cost two or $300. So they may upcharge you a significant amount based on your own, they're banking on that you're ignorant on the topic. So that's one reason why it's really important to learn this, even if you're not installing your own system, because they, maybe you want to upsize your inverter, maybe they have a four kilowatt inverter and they're like, all right, well, you know, you need the 6.4 kilowatt inverter, but it only costs $800 more, but they charge you $2,000 more. And that's, that's just what they'll do just to get more money. So unfortunately, that's how it kind of goes sometimes. So just be, it's very good to be as educated on it as you can so that if they tell you, oh yeah, it's gonna be $2,000 to upgrade that inverter, in reality, you could be like, why is it $2,000 when it should only be $800? Because I looked at the price between the two different inverters on this website. And then they're gonna be like, oh crap, we've been caught out. Any other quick questions? Yes. Hold on, come over. Oh. <clears throat> Our doctor Flowers outside taking care of a medical emergency. You made it, Jonathan. I did. 
Yeah. Or just a comment. We've tried to talk to our electric co-op, looking at our options and do we want to do grid tie and other things, and they act very ignorant about answering any questions for us. Mm. They do not want you going solar. They want you using their electricity. And so when you walk in and say, hey, can I talk to someone about this? Oh, we don't have anyone. We don't have anyone within our co-op who is on a solar system. Nine times out of 10, that is going to be a lie. We have someone less than two miles from us who is on a solar system from the same co-op. But they don't want you to do that. So prepare for them acting ignorant, even when they're not truly that ignorant. The cost of, yeah, the cost of solar systems are going down so much that I do think in the next 10, 15, 20 years, it's going to be way, like the utility companies may become pretty obsolete. Like it's just getting so cheap. And that's the problem. I mean, look, uh, air conditioning and comfy seats and retirement funds. You know, all that stuff costs money, and so the more we become independent, the more that threatens their existence, right? So that's their whole goal is to keep you in the system. There's, there's places that if you don't do your homework, they tell you that you can't live on that piece of land that you've already bought until you have a foundation that, you know, so you can have a septic, so you can have electric, and so they just keep piling all the stuff on you to make your debts go up, 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 and so you stay in the system. They want you in the system, all the way from food to every need you have. And that's way, you know, we kind of been programmed as kids growing up, you know, you go to the store, you send your kids to school, you do, and you're co-opting out your whole life, and that's what these kind of uh, seminars are for, and this knowledge that Derek brings, and all of our speakers, and so you guys can kind of break those chains, and you know, at whatever level it is for you, everyone's not the same, that you can take more control of your own life back, and then teach your kids how to be more sustainable, and how to take more of their control over their life as they grow. Very good point. Mr. Doug. Dougie. <laughs> All right, do, you, do, you like, do, uh, do you like that name, Leo Dougie? Oh, Dr. Leo has a question. <laughs> he doesn't like it. <laughs> oh. All right, any more questions? Seriously? Man, so man, there's like 10 or 15 questions. I think that was so quite a few. Power, so far, so confusing. <laughs> I thought, man, everybody's hand would be up. Like I try to keep it, I cut a lot of, lot of stuff out of my presentation that would have made it really boring. So I try to keep it like somewhat relatable. <laughs> hold on, Derek, boring? Come on. All right, hold on. Well, the volts and the amps and the power. I've heard of setting up a uh, solar system to where, like, let's say in the heat of the day, you've already filled your batteries up to full capacity, mm -hmm. but then your solar panels can still generate power and possibly to tie that into, say, like a water heater as kind of a, a dump source mm -hmm. for the excess power. Could you talk more about that? That's kind of how my system works. Like my batteries are typically charged up by 10 in the morning or 11 o'clock. So any, you could even set up a timer on your water heater to do that automatically. So th that would be pretty something simple to do, yeah. <clears throat> you also increase your battery bank? Sure. Just so you have more capacity? I'm, Absolutely. I'm, I don't have solar, so I, I'm asking yeah. questions. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you have and actually, panels to produce power, and then that fills up what you have existing in your battery bank, you can then add a few more batteries to even collect more power, mm -hmm. so then you can even go a little longer. Or sure. And another good dump source is, a, is an electric vehicle. All right, right. Mr. Because it's, it's got a huge battery bank. They're between 70 to 100 kilowatt hours worth of batteries in them. So you can just dump all that extra electric that you have. Maybe you could set up an electric, uh, an electric car charging service or something. Maybe right, it that the way. Last question. You're lucky now. It's just flowers here. Okay. Here's the okay. last question. This is just more comment uh, in the question to what happens to old panels. And we, our system is going on 10 years. We're still. Uh, generating at rated capacity. Yeah. And I know a lot of people who will be glad to take panels that have derated 10 or 15 percent, use them in a situation mm -hmm. that's not critical. So I've actually never seen panels get to the point where they need to be recycled unless they're just physically damaged or something, right. or something physically has happened to them, but never just degraded. Yeah, the they still work. Them. They still work. It's just at a lower rate, that's all. Why not? Well, that's it. Thanks a lot, Derek. Awesome. Thanks Great so much, guys. Over.